Okay, uh, welcome to uh, Theoretical Foundations for Data Science, or uh, DFDS. I'm Raz, um, I'm the lecturer for the course, and uh, I'm going to do a, a brief introduction just because uh, this will be in YouTube. So this is me. Um, I'm an associate professor in mathematics with specialization in data science at Uppsala University. And uh, I um, am also a researching, developing, and enabling chair in mathematical data engineering sciences. Um, at Combion Mix, which is uh, the AI arm of the network of, of uh, companies in Sweden called uh, the Combion Network. Okay, so uh, that's a bit about me. Today's uh, lecture is, uh, is recorded and it will be on YouTube because uh, some of uh, um, other core researchers are interested in viewing it. So what is today's lecture about? So you can actually um, look at the syllabus for the course, it's here. And um, it's essentially maybe to read this. So one of the learning outcomes, so we've been going around, we in fact just proved that Levenko Kantali theorem and the Dvoratsky Kaipel of its inequality and are about to get into Bachmann Chernikis theory. This is our statistical um, learning theory. And the topic for today is about uh, derive and implement algorithms, specifically decision procedures, including those designed for use under, under resource constraints. And uh, the other main thing is to be able to uh, do such things for uh, applicable law. So this is just uh, 50 minutes. Um, I will kind of give you a decision theoretic framing of this problem. So let's uh, start with a few resources I wanted to share. So if you do a Google search for the joint operating environment, uh, I guess when you turn on the light, you guys can't see the screen. So you can maybe turn off the light until we go back to the board. Um, okay. Anyway. Um, so maybe it's a little bit clear. So we are going to talk about a few things. Um, joint operating environment. So these are some, some basic things you need to be cognizant of. And if you follow the one from the jcs.mil, so that's US military, it owns the .mil domain. Is a basically it was a DARPA project that brought us the internet. So uh, here are various things, right? So I have read these two in detail. I haven't really gone into 2035. So uh, yeah, so let's see. So this is the Joint Operating Environment or JOE 2035. Of course, there is also a Chinese uh, and Russian military uh, views on this. This is the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, uh, yeah, the joint force in a contested and disordered world. Distribution statement approved for public release. Distribution is unlimited. Okay. Um, what is all this about? Think about the future. Um, so together we will use this document to support and accelerate our future strategy and force planning activities across the joint force. It is a primary source of the problem sets addressed through the forthcoming capstone concept for joint operations and related force development activities. The ideas here should encourage a dialogue about what the joint force should do and be um, they need to protect the United States, its allies and partners. Of course, this is our the US view, right? And one should also see the views of other uh, nuclear powers that can um, guarantee the omnipresence of von Neumann's mutually assured destruction, right? So von Neumann is the same von Neumann I'm seeing. So there is actually a principle uh, and the omnipresence of this is one of the axioms we've been using. And in fact, JOE is actually how to operate in a way where we don't go there. So there is a joint operating environment where all, all humans are, or, and other things are working, there's trade and, you know. I'm not gonna go through all of this. Uh, you can sort of look at it if you're interested. This is not like a mandatory reading or anything, but just to give you some, some idea. 
So for example, you can sort of follow this. You can also chase the sort of Chinese and Russian views on this. The EU has a new view as well. So here is a Joe 2010. Um, so here, I guess I want to maybe just read a bit about the study. The joint environment is intended to inform joint concept development and experimentation through the US Department of Defense. It provides a perspective on future trends, shocks, context, and implications for future joint force commanders and other leaders and professionals in the national security field. This document is speculative in nature and does not uh, suppose to predict what will happen in the next 25 years. That is intended to serve as a... So it's interesting, right? So if you read this, you will start seeing what, uh, what US intelligence thought in 2010 about what is about, can happen on wars over water. Wars over water have already started in the Nile right now, today at BBC, right? There's also interesting operations done by the Chinese field troops in the Himalayan border, right? Where and there are a lot of the glaciers are there. So a lot of these details are there. Why does this all matter? Well, okay, it matters because we are going to talk about uh, something called life experiments. Life experiments, conditions of life experiments. And that they are basically living things that will have a, a decision problem. Their decision problem is to basically continue through time and, and they love their babies, you know, whether they're frog babies or whatever. So there is a basic problem of continuing through time. And so all of these things have to be kind of borne in mind when we think about uh, these things, right? The last thing, I, I really wish I, I kept this uh, open. I'm gonna have to do a live quick search. So just bear with me. Um, so um, what I wanted to quickly show you is, uh, sorry. Um, one second. So let's see if I can find posts. Yes, and I have to go a tiny bit back. So there was actually an interesting uh, meeting in Uppsala by the Voluntary Autonomous Software and AI Programs Humanities and Social Sciences Division, and they actually are here it is. So as you see, um, can, you, can people see that's Uppsala's uh, theater, where if you get a PhD or whatever degree, you get your coronation there. So um, this was a, a, a very interesting um, uh, meeting. There were people from uh, India, like representing the ministry, India and France, like uh, talking about how, how the legal and ethical aspects of artificial intelligence could be framed in a way so that corporations in the capitalist, modern capitalist model, right? I'm excluding Russia out of this and, and China out of this for a moment. The so-called capitalist models in democratic, so-called democratic states, how are things going and, uh, you know, how do you actually uh, have a legal framework to bind the, the, the powers that corporations can have, right? So this is a very important ongoing discussions, both from the EU side, like the GDPR and so on, and also from the US side. And also we have to be cognizant of what's happening within China for the Chinese people and how Chinese corporations are moving out from China. And there's a lot to bear in mind, right? Of course, it's Russia as well. But so here is a, here's a very simple, uh, Here's a very simple question I wanted to ask. See this? Yeah, so um, so it's kind of a long thing and I, I hope it'll tie things together. So this is, um, so there is uh, someone named Walt Whitman who said the uh, democracy is the state of minds of the individuals who make up the governing state. Demo. People, democracy rule, democracy is nothing but the state of minds of the, of the individuals who make up the state, okay? Because if everybody wants to take a whole bunch of another people or another species and eat them or feed them in ovens, then it's also democracy, right? You, you need to understand that it's really up to, so there is, so you can understand various populist traditions you know, all over the democratic states, even in Europe, and in, could be seen as uh, in this context, right? So you need to be aware of it. So now, um, so under this definition of democracy uh, and also the fundamental theorem of pattern recognition, right? Statistics, which is this 
Schools of Bartnik and Chervenenkis, uh, that's what we basically are about to see. We prove the glimenko Cantelli theorem. So under this definition of, uh, of, uh, of uh, bartnik chervenenkis theory, we can paraphrase this in, in English as AI systems can only possibly exploit existing self-propagatable status quo. This is just what I mean, what's meant by the independent dynamically distributed assumption. Okay, the ghosting tricks, the symmetrization, they all are constrained by the IID assumption. Okay. And uh, and you know, people may get into pedantic wars about oh, now I have a dependent Markov chain or I have a Markov random field or something super complex. And it's it, it can all be seen as as uh, essentially jazzes on this basic idea. So one can only have machine learning algorithms or AI algorithms that can exploit a status quo that can be propagated in society. Okay, so concretely, you know, if people like to to be liked, right, in social media, and there is actually psychological, uh, evolutionary, behavioral, psychological reasons for this, we get a dopamine rush, and a corporation uh, plans and meticulously, meticulously exploits this this sort of behavior that is desired, right, for their own commercial gains, then that's possible because it's possible, right? So one needs, one needs to understand this very simple uh, uh, assumptions, okay? So I'm sort of jumping between IID and <laughs> something else, but so if you want to fully understand this, you can read uh, a really nice book uh, called The Hype Machine. Okay, so this just came out last year. The Higher Machine by uh, Sinai. Uh, as you can see all of this stuff I'm talking about. Okay, so that's the second point. Democracy is the state of minds of individuals that make up the state. And uh, AI systems can only possibly exploit existing self-propagatable propagatable status quo, right? This includes norms and their ever-hastening fragmentary shifts, behaviors, co-fabricated notions of solidarities, nationalities, etc that are natural due to ecological and economical axioms of scarcity, right? So this is the the next main thing, right? So we have ecological and ecological and economics, eco in Greek is house, economic axioms of scarcity. So there is always scarcity, right? We're not in, we're not in Star Trek. We haven't turned it. We are going infinite energy and turn energy into matter, right? Like in Nia Martini and Star Trek. So we're not there. So that's the next main point, right? So now the question is as follows, right? So this was posed to uh, the panel at the, at the sort of uh, uh, BOSP HS uh, panel, right? What is the role of a governing state, right? Besides those such as, say, Russia and China, so we sort of leave them out, it's more complicated, to effectively limit the unsustainable diversity minimizing exploitability by corporations. These are legal entities that are operating in these democratic states, right? Under, under any law, okay, there are different laws. Like Sweden's sovereign laws can override EU laws, right? And EU laws uh, can be implemented. I mean, they're only good as they can be enforced, right? There are lots of technical details. So if you have a bunch of teenagers operating in EU soil, but through servers in Australia to manipulate like, US, uh, you know, social media, uh, this happens, happened, then how can you actually send enforcement agencies because they are in EU soil, although the physical machines are, are actually put in, say, Australia or something like this. This is unresolved as far as I understand the law. I descended deeply into This is a law on against incitement to genocide that was made after World War II. You know, it's a very deep law. It's in the EU. But there are all these issues. That's what I mean by... Uh, under any law by explicitly addressing or co-addressing with its subjects. So these are the people that make up the democracy, including individual citizens. Um, at least Walt Whitman's paraphrase inside the, the state of the minds of the individuals and the governing state defines democracy. So I'm parsing a lot of stuff. I'm sorry, I studied bachelor's for nine years, uh, mathematics and biology but almost have a major in religion and philosophy and spent two years in the Ogallala Lakota Reservation in South Dakota, where we tried to go completely off grid and do buffalo sharecropping and simply eat buffalo meat from sunlight. Right? So I just played around a bit. So my, 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 what I'm saying is hopefully uh, 
uh, will be made much more precise now because we will start doing some mathematics. So I'm going to stop my screen share. Okay, and we'll turn this off. So, I guess I'm supposed to pin this somehow. Okay, so let's, uh, I mean, I don't have any more outlines than this, so let's kind of go here. So, so we have, uh, so definition one is, uh, so you know who an experimenter is, right? An experimenter, you know, that's an experiment. So this is the, the statistical experiment we've seen. But we can actually drop down to the level of uh, Lugosi's work on uh, learning prediction in games. So we don't have to limit ourselves to a probabilistic setting, although it includes a probabilistic setting. An experimenter simply does an experiment to take an action. Action. Uh, to minimize some, some notion of loss or regret. Loss or regret, okay? So this is uh, what an experiment was. And uh, I, I won't go into, so you should recall, uh, yeah, you can, re you can recall what a decision procedure is and a decision problem and so on and so forth here in the back. But an experimenter, need not be a human being necessarily. So that's the first realization. And so you can actually, for example, um, so it depends on what the, what, the, what the loss is and what you're trying to minimize. So if, if the loss uh, that you want to minimize is actually, um, you know, so the, the you know, loss basically can be, um, so the experiment, the problem can be, let me put it this way. So the decision problem could be uh, staying alive, which is basically formally it's uh, going through time as uh, topologically closed uh, sense of self. So that's formally what's happening. So what I mean by topologically closed self is basically, you know, you have the lipid bilayers, right? So this is hydrophilic and hydrophobic sites. This is, I'm, I'm drawing pictures of the, uh, the sort of, um, so this is the oil part, the water part, and this is how you create the boundary of the cell, right? And so this could be say the zygote, the cell that was formed in your mother's egg and your father's sperm met, it made this thing, right? Because the sperm cell came in and then just rewinding the clock and then the egg was there and then they, they kind of sperm enters the egg but fighting with millions of sperms and so on. And uh, once it dumps its load, its genetic load, then you have this thing called the nuclear membrane. This is now the lipid bilayer and inside you have like chromosomes from both the mother's side and the father's side, right? This is for the deployed story. But this zygote for one individual human differentiates. It has a branching process, so it becomes four cells and eight and sixteen and so on, this blastula, and eventually it becomes an adult human. Or oh, an adult human. And like this, it, this process repeats in different individuals, and then two humans come together and whatever, they make love. And they produce little babies, zygotes, which grow into humans, and so on. So that's basically called population genetics. This, this specific process is called the pedigree process. Right? These are all well-established theories in, in, in mathematical and statistical population genetics. 
So let's say that's sort of happening, say one human subpopulation, say what human subpopulation that's undergoing a pedigree process, right? We'll draw the details. Here's another subpopulation that's say, so here's Norwegian one, we have the Swedish one. So there's, so you can imagine mapping different subpopulations all over the planet. And they're all undergoing pedigree processes, right? And of course, you know, we can throw in the Kiwi National Anthem and say the substring is in bonds of love we meet. So, what is, so we meet, right? Because, you know, we're somehow hardwired to, to, to care for our own genes or whatever. I don't want to get into these theories, but the basic fact is that you love your children and you want to take care of them and yourself and so on. So, so you do lots of operations to ensure that this definition of self, which means this boundary, between self and everything else, the environment non-self is preserved. How do you preserve the boundary? You preserve the boundary because there's always entropy that breaks down these things, right? Uh, when I say boundary, I mean, you know, not just cycle of everything, right? So uh, then you need energy to come into the system and then with energy, you can ingest and then, and then you basically energy and matter. And then you can keep building these, these walls that keep breaking, right? So you need food. Point. So that's essentially how you continue to keep going the pedigree process. Of course, at, at, the, at the linguistic level for humans, you know, people speak different languages with the boundary for a reason. There's Norwegian and there's similarities. And, and you can actually look at the entire linguistic tree and superimpose it with the genetic tree. So this is all done when well understood. So the point is now there are different human subpopulations. Subpopulations each of them undergoing uh, these pedigree processes, okay? So now let's move into the Darwinian synthesis where we drop down the time scale. So this is the time scale of human generations, right? It's 30 years or so, or not maybe 20, 20 years or so. So you go back in time, what will happen? All these different human subpopulation pedigree processes will, you know, coalesce and so there'll be like some common ancestors and so on. And, you know, maybe there's an Eve, who knows there are multiple Eves different theories, with some Adam, you know, some, some notion of Adam and Eve, and you can actually see start, see people are, you know, so this becomes some, some population, there are theories about exiting Africa and so on and so forth. So you can kind of run the clock backwards and see what happens to all these human subpopulation pedigree processes as we go back in time. So that's just one species. This species may have speciated, you know, come away from another ancestral species of both the chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans. So you have chimpanzee, human, and orangutan, and bonobo, and whatever, like it keeps growing. So this is the ape tree. Right? This is Linnaean sort of Darwinian synthesis, right? So you have, like, so now you have the pedigree processes of subpopulations are in here, and for another species, they're all in here. And so now we are just interested in how they, they come together. So this is now a speciation event, okay? So it's a different time scale. This is not order millions of years will be like this, okay? So now we have the primate phylogeny here. And then, you know, if I redraw the primate phylogeny, it's gonna be sort of in one tiny corner. And uh, <laughs> so this is maybe primates, this is like, I don't know, Horses and dogs, and boom, boom, boom. So then, if you go all the way back, there's some things with other animals, and then plants, and then fungi, right? And prokaryotes. Prokaryotes don't have a nuclear membrane, and you see all of this come together in uh, something called the, the phylogeny, right? The global phylogeny. Global phylogeny. So this object, interestingly enough, you know, actually is. So if you get inside the, the, the lipid bilayer of any one of them, and imagine running the magic school bus back in time, you can come out and emerge into the lipid bilayer of a fungus that's in a forest. You go far enough back, right? You can come back. So it means they're topologically close. If you could move forward and backward in time, you could jump into a, 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 you know, a nucleus of fungus that you eat, go all the way back, and then come back if you really want. So at full water, it's a sort of close. So this object is actually in space and time, it's a continuum, right? So that's what we call life. So that's the definition of life. So life has a clear sense of self and non-self. Depending on the scale of time you look at, it can be just yourself and your sisters and brothers and your family. And uh, if you keep changing the time scale and follow through this topologically notion, topological notion of self, 
it can go to different things, right? Okay, so now a life experimenter is simply, uh, so now we define life. So now a life experimenter or you can also combine this with the tradition of life experimenters. I'm using these a bit um, life experimenters. So what are they? They are essentially, you can think of them in many ways. One natural way is to embed this with, uh, with the Darwinian notion of species if you want. This gets already into problems. So there are many resolutions, so there are different resolutions of life experimenters. So resolutions mean how do we how do we actually have a very well-defined notion of this topologically closed uh, subset of this life, right, uh, object. So if we use a dominant notion of species, then it's simply all the, it's basically the subset of all human populations who can still produce fertile offspring by interbreeding with each other. So all of humans on the planet can do this as far as we know. Hopis came very close to speciation, but uh, what that makes. So anyway, but you can also have other things, right? You can also have national level, right? So all the Swedes are in one tradition. And, and so now when we start, we don't need to define the resolution, but we, we just understand there are different resolutions, right? So when I talk about diversity minimizing operations in the, in the LinkedIn post I read, one needs to think about what happens when a life experimenter, a traditional life experimenters, take you know, the, you know, their sort of decision problem. Going through time, they actually start doing various operations, right? So in the decision problem of going through time, right, uh, staying alive or going through time, staying alive, they have to. Um, to um, you know, do some operations, uh, basically to feed themselves. Okay, I, I don't want to overly uh, to feed themselves, right? And of course, we have resource constraints. We have we don't have infinite resources, so that's kind of the basic setting. So now you have traditions of life experimenters. So, so for concreteness, imagine a frog population somewhere in the Amazon that has its babies and loves its babies and its own mind and so on. There's no hierarchy here, right? So, uh, well, it's, it's, it needs a certain kind of a biosystem, right? Some kind of an ecosystem it lives in and so on. And of course, the humans that are sort of under Bolsonaro right now are, are moving there, cutting the forest, burning, trying to grow cattle. And say you go to the Ica store and you want to get this really nice cheap cut of expensive beef, you know, from Brazil, it's, it, it costs less. You, you know, the, the point is, you know, you by that choice of buying that meat is propagating a lot of operations down in the Brazilian forest, for example, that could affect the life of a tradition of some frog species. So you need to sort of see these things. You know, we're talking about how one set of operations done by a tradition of life experimenters actually can affect the, the existence or non-existence of others, right? So all of this is sort of um, happening, and it's because of these constraints. So now, uh, on top of all of this, we 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 have so we have definition three. So we now drop down these are sort of more abstract. Let's drop down to the so-called uh, traditions, right? So the national this is the national resolution, right? The idea of a nation state is relatively new in the start of Europe the last century. Right. So this is a national uh, resolution of uh, life experimenters, right? So here we basically have for every nation, modern nation these days, we have a so-called academic military industrial complex. Right. So this is I'm quoting the original speech by Eisenhower. He was president of Obama. So uh, initially, it, it was called Academic Military Industrial Complex of the United States, but then they removed academic because it was too academic. <laughs> so, so that, but you understand, this is what every nation does, right? It trains its people. And then uh, there is, of course, military, for defense, and there's industry, right? And this complex is what 
essentially protects the, the, the national population. That is exactly what happens, right, in, in modern in, in modern geopolit geopolitics, right? Constantly at war games at the boundary, depending on what you read. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, in Gotland, there's a lot of movement, <laughs> Swedish troops and, and navy. There's a lot of interesting operations happening under the Baltic, right? You know, right now and for a while. And same thing, China does this, and India does that, and everybody, Iranians do stuff. So anyway, this thing, unfortunately, or fortunately, has a, a, a sort of, you know, so these are operations, standard things, trade and so on, and military. But what I want to emphasize is that we have to, in, in this formulation, we basically have to assume von Neumann's mutually assured destruction is always present. That means, you know, things could potentially trigger to a point where nuclear states could, in fact, annihilate one another. Okay? I mean, I'm not saying this is what, this is what they say the US would most people. This is how you assume when you move, right? And uh, so now, at this cusp of the omnipresence of von Neumann's NAD and the ecological and economic constraints of various national notions of life experimenters, right, propped by the academic military industrial complex, we have the so-called joint operating environment. We have to operate jointly in the environment. Ideally, we can all somehow go through time, right? Without. So that's basically the, 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 the joint game theoretic context, right? So we can see this as a decision problem, of course, okay? So on this, in this context, what I want to spend the next several minutes is talking about, about how all of this relates to this course, right? So, well, the connection is vision theory, but, but the problem is this. So now we focus specifically on, on um, AI systems. So this is uh, AI systems. Um, so these are, I don't know, we can define them as um, some kind of algorithms. Um, algorithm, algorithmization, algorithm, algorithmization. Um, um, and then datafication. So these are words used in uh, more social sciences and sort of human, uh, humanist communities that study what AI is doing to society, right? So uh, everything is, you know, turned into data. Data somehow becomes like uh, the new commodity, right? Uh, and uh, algorithmization and, and automation is basically, um, um, you know, is actually having machine implementable algorithms that, that can be used to do automated decision, right? And, uh, and auto, 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 yeah, auto, auto, automatization, automatic algorithms, okay? So I, I don't want to define this too much, right? Because then I want you to think about things like um, routing, okay, in traffic. So you, most people jump into Uber and go somewhere. Uber is a company, it's doing really well, and it, it uses various things. It uses where you are, where the drivers are, and it uses some algorithms to find ways to go. Now, when these things happen, okay, Uber is great, everyone uses Uber, but there are some other things one has to worry about. How does the Uber operations actually affect pollution, congestion for the whole society, right? Because Uber is not directly thinking about it. There are no incentives for the corporation to do that, right? But uh, there are actually plans, uh, if you follow the voluntary autonomous software, if you have a program in humanities and social sciences, by the way, uh, in fact, there is actually on March 17th or 13th, there is a, something anyone can attend if you register. It's about uh, thinking about sort of societal consequences of transportation systems in this sort of AI framework, right? So I encourage you to, to, to look at it. So uh, in, this, in this setting, what I want to point out next is, um, um, so we have, I said, a democratic state in this way I sort of define. And the way I've defined it is, uh, is purposely sort of 
uh, vague because um, because the point is we want uh, the individuals to have a say. And this is the only way it's going to work. To have a say in how the AI systems are actually being built for society, right? And the video I sent you yesterday uh, as an optional reading, uh, I, I won't play this now, but the video I sent you is actually uh, exactly about this, right? So I will show you what I mean. Maybe let me share the screen briefly again. Um, Okay, so, um, um, so first of all, um, yeah, here it is. Uh, maybe we will make this uh, non-optional. And so I will have an individual problem from this. So if you watch this, can you see the screen? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, so I won't play the whole thing, but I just want to point out that uh, how I stop, how I learned. Back in 2004, I was driving my lovely spouse to a conference. She is an obstetrician gynecologist. So this is Michael Lippmann. He's the same guy that was doing the dance for Akapawa. <laughs> He's a professor of machine learning, I really like him, but he's basically quickly talking about, the title is How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Be Realistic About AI. It's very important to, to watch this. Actually, let's make this an assignment because he's contrasting what Elon Musk says to a bunch of politicians and why you should be kind of cautious about this, right? Elon Musk and a whole bunch of people are like, oh, this is this, whatever, AI is gonna take over. And, well, it's really up to us, whatever this means, right? So the ND basically says, you know, it's really up to us and uh, I won't play the last few minutes. But, but watch this, it's only 20 minutes, it's totally worth it. And then uh, the, the reading, I would like you to actually read this. This is a very recent paper. Uh, and it's by Virginia Dignam. She's the director of the Voluntary Autonomous Software Program for Humanities and Social Sciences. She's at UMIO. And uh, this is called Relational Artificial Intelligence. And uh, the abstract says the impact of artificial intelligence does not depend only on fundamental research and technological development, but for a large part on how these systems are introduced into society and used in everyday situations. Even though AI is traditionally associated with rational decision-making, understanding and shaping the societal impact of AI in all its facets requires a relational perspective. A rational approach to AI where computational algorithms drive decisions making independent of human intervention, insights and emotions has shown to result in bias and exclusion, laying bare societal vulnerabilities and insecurities. A relational approach that focus on the relational nature of things is needed to deal with the ethical, legal, societal, cultural, and environmental implications of AI. A relational approach to AI recognizes the objective and rational reasoning uh, that, that, uh, that objective and rational reasoning can, cannot, does not always result in the right way to proceed because what is right depends on the dynamics of the situation in which the decision is taken. And that rather than solving ethical problems, the focus of design and use of AI must be on asking the ethical question. Okay. In this position paper, I start with uh, Virginia starts with a general discussion of current conceptualizations of AI, followed by an overview of existing approaches to governance and responsible development and use of AI. Then I reflect over what should be the basis of a social paradigm for AI and how this should be embedded in relational, feminist, and non-Western philosophies, in particular, the Ubuntu philosophy, right? So this is a, let's, well, okay, if you want, yeah, I'll make an individual assignment based on reading comprehension of this paper. I think it's super important to go from the details of, of things inequality to relational AI because it, it, it matters. Uh, and in fact, you're my students of mathematics. So um, I think this would be very good. 
So let me stop the share and uh, try to finish up in the last five minutes. So we've said a lot of things and uh, I, I hope it's not too confusing. It should be kind of obvious, okay? So this is basically what's going on and what are you gonna do about it is what I, I'm asking here, right? We have to do something about it if we, if you, if you, you know, we have no choice. So what, what are you going to do about it? And uh, I mean, I think, you know, I think in the, in the corporate uh, capitalist system, right, there are, there are, the solutions depend on which system, right? If you're in China, well, you have to do something different. If you're in Russia, very different and so on. But let's say in the sort of modern, basically the modern West and, and parts of the rest of the world, like Japan and India and so on. There are corporate entities, right? They can engage in business activities. And so one way to go about this is to actually start your own company and do, do what you want and so on. So that's one natural way. You become an entrepreneur, you, you do things, right? So there are these companies called Trace, I think, um, on Earth. So they, they, and so, um, so they, they say it's a, it's a, they have office in Stockholm as well. So they are interested in like identifying exactly where raw materials come from in any product. So 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 so, so many vegans in Sweden, and and a large subset of the vegans are really worried about not eating Brazilian soy. If the Brazilian soy actually comes from recently burned forests, how do you tag it, right? So uh, I mean I I think uh, yeah. There's actually a law. I can quickly check this up for a minute, so so you see something a bit more concrete. Yeah, here's the European Due Diligence Act, right? So just to um, I don't want to share screen again, but there's something called the European Due Diligence Act. What does this do? This act was just passed a couple of months ago. It's a progress in law um, towards enforceable due diligence rules and strict feasibility of the commodities and products uh, with geolocation tags. Uh, these are requirements of operators and traders to ensure deforestation free markets through enforcement authority. It's a beautiful, beautiful law. So it actually is going to enforce commodity traders and Stockholm Stock Exchange eventually need to be able to tag this geopositioning you know, thing, right? So you know exactly where things are coming from. So, well, I don't know. So, so Trace is working on some things on the sort of publicizing front, but now trading has to happen, at least in, in, in the EU, the tax, right? So now, I don't know, you can, for example, be, you know, just try to make a money. You can, you can build your own sort of algorithm to do financial trading for, you know, that, that's somehow cognizant and aware of, of, of the green footprint or something like this. So, I mean, I, I think I, I don't want to say it too much, but basically the entrepreneurial angle is one way to go. Right? The other way, obviously, because I'm talking about it from an individual point of view, what can you do, right? So the other natural way is to go to work, right? To work. And if you watch the, the last bit of the video, what, uh, what he says is, uh, you know, um, the YouTube video is basically, you know, as an analyst, as a data analyst, scientist, whatever, or a software engineer, you are, you have an ethical obligation. You, you know, you, you can, and you know, a lot of people have come out, for example, people that came out from Facebook and spoke a lot how Facebook was doing whatever it was doing. I mean, I personally think that Facebook allowed, you know, I mean, it's not I personally, there's a lot of evidence that Facebook essentially allowed the, the massacre of the Rohingya population in Myanmar. Okay, this is a serious thing. I mean, right? One could potentially try and take Zuckerberg to court, right? So I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I like Zuckerberg. You know, my brother-in-law's work for him, so no, I, mean, I, I don't like him. But, you know, it's, he's, he's doing what he's doing. But the point is, one cannot get upset about a corporate entity or a CEO because they have good visions. They're trying to do something that they think is right. But the law itself has to provide the scaffolding on which these operations can proceed, right? So we, we, you know, and progress is being made on it. But the problem with AI is that it evolves so fast, right? That law is always trying to catch up, and hopefully that bridge can be fixed. So I think I'll stop there. If there are any questions?
Maybe we can take it after the recording has stopped.